He is a part of the, the amazing 80s group that we all know here in America as Kasha Gugu, Mr. Lama. How are we doing today, sir? Okay, everybody, sing along. To shy, shy, hush, hush. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you sing that in, in your sleep by this time, right? Um, I tell I tell people that on my vocal cord, um, you know when you know if a lot of people walk over a piece of grass, uh, the, uh, always at the same place, and eventually the grass starts wearing away. That that's what's happened on my <laughs> vocal cords. <laughs> For, for two of my songs, that one and Never Ending Story, they, they, when I sing those songs, there's just a groove in my vocal cord that it automatically goes to, I think. You know, I don't even have to think about it, so. That's too funny. I love it. That's too funny. Well, um, um, I know you are a very, very talented person, a very talented musician. Uh, l let's, let's take a step back and take me back to when you were growing up in the uh, northwest part of England. And who were you listening to while you were growing up that made you say to yourself, you know, I want music to be a huge part of my life? Oh, Motown, without a, without a doubt. Interesting. Any, any, any artist in particular? Oh, um, all of them. I mean, I... I I became slightly Motown obsessed, really. I'll tell you why. There was a famous music venue in Wigan, my hometown, called the Nor uh, sorry, called the Wigan Casino, and it was part of a movement that was called Northern Soul. And I won a singing contest there, and I was only like 16 years old. I don't even know how I got in the place, because he had to be 18. But I, my, bro my older brother used to go, and he was popular there, and I think they just turned a blind eye, and they let me in. They probably felt sorry for me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, there was a an old big Northern Soul hit uh, called Under My Thumb by an uh, artist called Wayne Gibson, mm -hmm. which was later covered by The Stones. And uh, that's the song that I won the singing contest with. And, you know, my family were very poor. We had no money. I had to really work hard to save enough money to just buy one single, one seven-inch single. So the singing contest, I won 10 albums of my own choice. So this was like every Christmas I'd ever had rolled into one. Right. And I went down the rec record store, and I just, I got... I think I got every Motown chart busters, you know, and they used to have those amazing artwork. Mm -hmm. um, I, I particularly remember the Silver Star one. It was like a Silver Star, and the song and the artist went along the sort of the ray of the star. Hmm. And it was everything. It was it was it was the Elgins. It was it was Jimmy Ruffin. It was the Four Tops. It was the Temptations. It was Dinah Ross. It was the Supremes. It was Edwin Starr. Um, I mean, and the list goes on. It was just incredible. You kind of started some acting, um, a little bit of an acting career there with the uh, production of Joseph and the Amazing uh, Technicolor Dream. And then in 1981, you were offered to be a part of the promo video for Adam and the Ants' Stand and Deliver video. How did that all come about? Uh -huh. um, I arrived in London, I was about 18. I mean, that in itself was, you know, um, quite something in my life because uh, from my hometown, my small town, in, in the north, you know, nobody went to London, but somehow I found my way here because I, I figured, you know, to get on in the music business, London was going to be the place to be. Mm -hmm. And then I was working in a very trendy, very, you know, very cool nightclub called the Embassy Club on Bond Street. And um, the video, there was a famous video director who'd done all the uh, Adam and the Ants videos and various other things had a great career in television, Mike Mansfield. And Mike's assistant came up to me in the club where I was a waiter. I was a waiter at that club. And he said, you know, it was, it was just one of those very casual things. He said, we're shooting the next Adam and the Ants video um, on Sunday at Hatfield House. Uh, if you want to come along and be an extra, and we'll give you a, you know, 150 pounds. <laughs> I said, right, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> And it was, um, you know, it was great experience, you know, watching how the whole thing came together. It was an incredibly long day. I mean, video shoots typically are, it was like an 18-hour day. They picked us up at 6 in the morning, and we didn't leave till, you know, 11 at night. But when you're that young, you're not tired. You just can go on forever, and you love it. It was, it was just so exciting. I was a little disappointed when I saw the finished video because I thought my makeup that I, was my own creation because I was quite artistic. Uh -huh. um, uh, and but if you you know if you blink you you really miss me in the video and some people got some really good close ups so I was a little bit sad about that but hmm. still very grateful for the experience. Then you were a part of uh, Vox Dux, you were part of uh, Crossword, then Brooks, and then you met up with the existing members of Kasha Gugu who were playing under the uh, the name Art Nouveau. How, how did you guys all meet up? Um, we 
almost missed each other, you know, destiny, fate, whatever you want to call it, you know, so weird. Um, I had put my own advert in the sort of musician's Bible at the time, which was a, a London uh, a music paper called Melody Maker. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I'd advertised for a, a keyboard player and a bass player and a drummer and a guitarist. And I'd seen... I must have seen like, I don't know, 40 people over a weekend. And I, you know, I thought some were promising and uh, I was very determined. And then out of the blue, I got a call from the bass player, Nick Beggs, uh, from Art Nouveau. And he said, look, we're already a band. I know you're looking for different musicians, but we are a band already. And we've actually been auditioning for singers and we didn't really find what we were looking for. Then we saw your ad. Do you want to you wanna come up and see us anyway? I said, sure. So I got the train. It was like an hour from London. And um, I went to meet the guys at the uh, greeting card factory mm -hmm. where the drummer worked. Um, and the drummer worked there and he had a good relationship with the manager and he used to let us rehearse there because it was a big warehouse. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> and I, well, I turned up, you know, in, this, in the most outrageous outfit, you know, um, because I was into Japan and um, and Visage and Adam and the Ants, so I had like some stuff on my face, and the, you know the hair was silver or something, and I, I probably got on the train and frightened a few old ladies. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved it. If you know, if I shocked, or I, you know, or I think I thought people were pointing. I just thought that was so cool. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, I loved the attention, and um, so I went up and met the guys and. Um, Nick later said, uh, the bass player, as soon as he met me off the train, he, he thought I was the right guy. How did you come up with your own personal stage name? Well, I was a fan of ABBA, um, and it wasn't very cool to like ABBA back in the... Even though they had a huge following, mm -hmm. you know, everybody was listening to... You know, it was, it was more cool to like, I don't know, you know, um, the Beatles or, you know, Led Zeppelin or... Or, or Genesis, or prog rock, or whatever, you know. And ABBA was just out-and-out out pop, but I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> and I read that um, how they got their name by using the, f the, four, uh, the first letter of their four Christian names, the first names, so mm -hmm. Ag Agnetha, B B Benny, Bjorn, and Anna Frieda. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. And I, I did think my own name was a bit boring for a pop star, Chris, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I started looking at my surname, Hamill, and I started switching the letters around. And the only thing I could come up with was Lamar. So I said, Lamar, Lamar. I thought, well, that sounds quite exotic. Anything that sounded <laughs> exotic, you see. Yeah. So I, I turned up at the rehearsal one day with the band, and I said, guys, don't call me Chris anymore. I'm Lamar. Uh, I did hear a bit of sniggering. <laughs> <laughs> when when I turned away, but in the end, it worked. How did you guys come up with the with the band name Kasha Gugu? What's the story behind that? Yeah, that, that's a good good question. And of course, you, as you can imagine, I've been asked that one before. <laughs> um, the the bass player Nick, who was the zaniest, uh, you know, character. He was really um, way over on the left left of center, uh -huh. and. Um, he just walked in one day, you know, we were looking for a new band name because there was already a band in the UK charts called Classics Nouveau. So w we all felt that the word Nouveau had, had sort of, we'd been beaten to the post really with that. So we're looking for a new name and Nick walked in one day and said, what do you think of the name Kajagugu? And I just loved it straight away. And the uh, the tune Ode to Be Ah, what, what was the background on that tune? Um, Ode to Be Ah was, was really... Um, just a, it was just really, the tongue was firmly in the cheek. It was just kind of looking at, um, it, it, it was kind of how I felt about the whole kind of London scene, about fashion and, and, and you know, and being very posy and, you know, and going out being uh, a little bit androgynous and a little bit uh, mysterious and trying to invent this sort of creature, if you like, um, in the nightclubs, it was easy to do that, you know, in the veil of the smoke <laughs> um, <laughs> and the noise and the, you know, and the dark lighting and the disco lighting, if you like, you know. It was just really about escaping from reality.
And who wrote the tune? Who came up with the tune, Hang On Now? How did that song come to be? Again, exactly the same process. You know, the, the, what happened with Kajigugu was, when I joined the band, um, the three of us um, le- left our day jobs, as it were, and we just wrote songs um, all day, every day. It sort of became our full-time thing. So uh, we were literally just looking for ideas the whole, the whole um, time. And, and it paid off because when the keyboard player from Duran Duran came into the nightclub where I worked, I had a cassette with me that I always carried with me. Mm-hmm. And, and um, our demos were great. There were great demos. You know, the, I, it was just the right time at the right place. But um, very different, you know, to today where I think um, young uh, performers, uh, or, you know, what, I think perhaps they, they are led to believe that fame can come instantly if you walk on one of these TV talent shows. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's not really the real world. Um, so we, you know, we were just, back in 1980, we were just crafting, working and working and working at the songwriting, developing the... And they were great musicians. I, I recognized that straight away. You know, it was when I met them, there was something fresh about them. Very cool. And then I know you launched uh, your solo career in 1983, and in 1984 uh, came the wonderful tune, The uh, the Never Ending Story. Now, you recorded that, and then I think you recorded an English version with uh, Beth Anderson, and then it became uh, a part of a, a movie soundtrack here in America called The Never Ending Story. Uh, tell me the background on that great tune. Um, well, JJ, I was um, in Tokyo at the Tokyo Music Festival, and... Um, I was there with my manager, Billy Gaff, who's a very flamboyant, uh, successful manager who worked with Rod Stewart through some of his biggest years, including Maggie May. And uh, Billy, my manager, was a real entrepreneur. He was a character. He was very colorful and interesting with lots of great stories to tell. And I think that he... He, George and Moroda was at the Tokyo Music Festival, and I, I and they went to dinner. I understood, and I be, I just imagined Billy telling Giorgio because that's the kind of salesman he was. You know, Lamal's going to be the best thing since sliced bread, and you you should use him. He'll be good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and then then when I when I got back to the UK, Giorgio's office called and uh, invited me to sing the song. Now initially, it was the best-selling book of all time in Germany by uh, the German author Michel Ende. The, you know, they were expecting a very, obviously a very big audience at the German cinema, even though they shot the whole thing in English. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time, Kajigugu were huge in Germany. So I think, you know, because it was a children's film and we were very popular with teenagers at the time, they kind of put two and two together. And then I'd met Giorgio, you know, in Tokyo. So the, the whole the whole thing sort of came together that way. How, how did you come up with the, uh, how did the debut album, Don't Suppose, how did that come all about? Well, um, you know, I, 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 I don't know if you know, but I, I, was, I was actually fired by the band in a phone call. Yeah, I know. And, I wasn't going to bring that he, up. But <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I did hear about I, that. No, it's okay. I, I've talked about it many times. Uh, I liked it. I like people to know what happened because, you know, it could be construed as um, an egotistical thing that I decided to go solo, and that it was far from the case. Mm-hmm. The band were, um, the band felt that we were too much like teeny idols, and they thought it was my fault because I was like the pretty guy up the front, <laughs> and so they dis- they thought if they get rid of me. Uh-huh. You know, they they could get more sort of musical credibility. Now, they have since basically gone on record saying, you know, it was a mistake. And as I pointed out to them, you know, the Beatles and the the Rolling Stones were teeny idols. Duran Duran were teeny idols. You know, your fans grow up with you and you, you get new fans along the way and perceptions about you change. And, you know, we could have easily, easily outgrown that, I think. Right. And, and to split up a winning formula after this worldwide smash hit you mm-hmm. know it's just absolutely crazy and i think they've probably all had some sleepless nights about it because um you know that they it was their decision not mine right but um i had no choice and so i threw myself into the deep end you know and 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 um don't suppose 
uh, was one of the songs for my first solo album, and it just seemed like a nice title for the album. Since, like, you know, 19, 1984, 1985, you, you've done some uh, countless projects. So what are you exactly working on today? Uh, my VAT return. <laughs> <laughs> the, VAT is, is a UK thing, value-added tax, yeah. Every quarter you have to do it. Very boring. Yeah, Very boring yeah, yeah. paperwork. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but um, now obviously I'm promoting my new single. And I'm doing that every week at the moment, you know, all, all over the world. I, I was approached by this small label in Norway, and it's a digital release, so it came out, you know, instantaneously around the world via, you know, iTunes and places like that. Mm -hmm. And that's a, whole, that's a whole new experience for me. Certainly one of the most exciting years of my life, you know, as a young, uh, as a young guy. And... Um, and so there's a there's a there's a very much an emotional connection for me, and I think the audience pick up on that, and and so I'm very proud of the single. I I really really like it a lot. I I, I just want to uh, uh, say Lamal that from the uh, from the great '80s group Kashagugu here in America, you guys are huge still today, um, and thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome, JJ. Thanks for chatting to me. Thank you for your support, and hope to speak to you again soon.